television. Well, on the Today Show and on live television, you have to make sure that in your introduction you are telling people what they most need to know. I still do this with people on The View. Now, tell me who so-and-so is. What is the name of that book? What is it about? Give them the salient facts. Most of the time, the people are told they'll be on from 7.30 to 8, or 8 to 8.30, so they figure they have a half hour. They don't. They have four and a half to five minutes, usually. So I think you have to very carefully construct your questions so that you do the most important questions at the top, the ones that you have to get through. And it depends on the kind of interview, you know, whether it's a news interview or whether it's a personality interview. There's some difference. You might want to leave the last question until the end, but then you've got to be able to take time um, um, cues. And something comes to my mind that I will tell you about. Um, and you also have to listen to what the person says. I've often said it's not the first question, it's the follow-up. What did you mean by that? Why do you say that? Um, you can't just, if you're someone who wants to be on television, read the questions, especially if they're not prepared by you, and then just go down the line with the questions. And we've heard people do that. You know, someone says, the worst period of my life somehow is when I lost my dog and I went into a deep depression. And then what's the next song you wrote? You know, you've, you've got to listen. So um, all of these are things that you learn with time and you also have to have an instinct for. I remember doing a live interview with Richard Nixon. This was when I was at ABC. It was many years later, and it was after Watergate. And it was the first live interview that he had done, and the first network interview that he had done after having left office, after being forced out of office. He had done one uh, interview earlier with David Frost, but it was an interview that he was paid to do, and, and it was edited, and therefore it wasn't the same. And I started out asking him foreign policy questions. What does he think about this, about that? And he was superb, as he always was in foreign policy. Two things happened. One, he perspired tremendously. And I realized when I'd heard about his early debates uh, with Jack Kennedy, the early debates for the presidency, and one of the reasons this was early television, uh, black and white, I believe, that they said that, uh, that Nixon uh, lost was that he perspired so and he wasn't wearing the right makeup. Well, he had the kind of, some people do perspire, you know, t and when I do interviews, I give him a piece of Kleenex and say, now blot yourself down. Okay. In the middle of that interview, I decided that I would then try to uh, give him some questions that would, that would have some humanity because he had been so reviled. And so I asked him what it was that got him through all those difficult times. And he said, uh, because I thought he'd say, my wife or my faith. And he said, why do you have to ask me these questions, Barbara? Uh, why don't you ask the serious things? And I said, well, Mr. Nixon, I, I think people really do want to know these things about you. Well, no, they're not. Um, let's get back to the important questions. So I started to look for my foreign policy questions again, and I couldn't find them. But I had written them myself, so I remembered all of them. And then we went on, and one minute, this is when I'm talking about time, I asked for a one-minute cue before the end of this hour interview. And I said, Mr. Nixon, are you sorry you burnt the tapes? And for the first time, he said, yes, I am. And he had only about 30 seconds to answer, and it was a great um, climax. And I remember that very well, because when I stood up, I realized that I had slipped the foreign policy questions under my seat, because I didn't want them to mix up with the others, and that's why I couldn't find them. And the other thing is, and I do it to this day, I write questions on little cards. As we talk now, I am preparing to do an interview with now Vice President Gore. I have recently done one with presidential uh, candidate George W. Bush. I write questions on cards, and I write hundreds. I write, this is for a big interview, I write everything I can think of. I go around and I say to people, what would you ask if you could, what would you ask? And then I boil them down and boil them down and boil them down. Now, if you have time, you can do that. If you don't, you're writing like this, because you may be doing an interview with something that happened 10 minutes ago. But I do a lot of homework, and if I'm talking to young people today, uh, it pays to do your own, your own homework. It pays to write your own questions. It pays to learn something about the editing process. All of this makes a difference. Mm -hmm. 
What are the keys to good editing? What do you look for when you're, when you're editing? A good opening and a very good close. And obviously what's in between has to be important. Um, but you really have got to, I think, capture that audience at the beginning and make them feel at the end, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a, uh, like a concerto, you know, and at the end of it, you know it's the end. It, it, it has its, its own beat. Um, obviously, you want to tell the story. And obviously, you want to get some of the person. And don't, don't be so intent on getting just the facts that you take out all the juice. While we're talking about interviewing here, uh, you know, the, in the trade, there's, it's, there's the, the sort of the thing that's, a, that's called a Barbara Walters question. What would you think is a Barbara Walters question? How would you answer that? Again, it depends on what we're doing. You know, now I do a news magazine program, 2020. I do specials. I do um, a daytime television program with four women plus myself, which is very freewheeling, but also has interviews. I do interviews on that. I, I might say to someone, what's the biggest misconception about you? Because you then learn things that they probably never thought they would tell you. Or they also bring up the rumors about themselves that they want to clear up. Um, I don't have too many set questions. I really do try to listen. Uh, one of the things that I have been accused of is asking people what kind of a tree they want to be. I hope that in history's time I will live this down. Actually, it only happened once. I was interviewing the great Catherine Hepburn, that wonderful, outspoken actress. And I said something about, you're such a legend. And she said, I'm like an old tree. And I said, oh, really? What kind of a tree? And she said, I'm like an oak. I'm not that willow in the backyard that's losing all its leaves. I'm like a great white oak. So. This is the only time I ever ask that question. And any time any reviewer wants to put me down, they say, oh, Barbara Walters with her, what kind of a tree? I'm also supposed to make everybody cry. And so I'm so careful now not to make anybody cry. But you know, if you start asking people about their childhood, and if I'm doing a personality interview, I very often start with the childhood, as you did with me. Because the effect of the childhood and the person they are today, whether it's a president, or a movie star, or a murderer, the childhood affects today. So I will very often start with that. And you know in that if you want to press certain buttons, um, sometimes it's surprising. But if you talk to me enough about my sister, I would well up. If you speak to someone about their father or their mother, especially if they're no longer alive, um, the tears will come. I try now very hard to stay away from that. So if there's a Barbara Walters question, I guess it's considered that it would be a, a more personal question. Although these days there are questions that are asked that I wouldn't dream of asking. But you know, again, we're in a different period. 